Hello and welcome to Creativity Uncovered. My name is Abby Gatling and I am on a journey to uncover how everyday people find inspiration, get inventive and open their imagination. So basically I want to find out how people find creative solutions and then how they use that at home, work, play and everything in between. And my goal for this podcast is that by the end of it, you'll be armed with a whole suite of tried and tested ways to summon creativity the next time that you need it. So today I'm speaking with Alice Rose McKinney. And Alice is a podcast operations coordinator. She has her own podcast as well. Um, and she's the founder of Sea Monster Productions. And I just, I really wanted to reach out to Alice because of an episode on her podcast, The Sounds of Reason. Um, it just really intrigued me and it was talking about making money as a creative and that sort of double-edged sword of popularity. So I'm really for- looking forward to unpacking that one today. Um, so welcome, Alice. Hi, Abby. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about this and obviously thank you for reaching out again and, uh, finding the podcast and listening to the episode. And yeah, I definitely think everything that you just said about, finding that safe space with creativity and how we need to be mindful of the fact that creativity is for everyone and it's not this thing that needs to be exclusive or elite or anything like that. Um, And I think the Taylor Swift example is a good one with the double-edged sword thing that kind of happens with her where she became really successful and is currently really successful and is basically like the biggest artist at the moment on the planet. Yes. And is literally making obscene amount of money, which I just think as an artist, like she must be looking at her career being like, how? Because she's already been so successful in the past. And I think every time she breaks through a new like achievement, she must just be looking at her career like how? Like am I here? Um, (laughs) yeah exactly and I just think the way that she's been treated in the last six months and she's already had this kind of treatment before as an artist but I think with the errors tour especially and how much success has come off the back of this tour people have kind of been saying statements like oh but like you know, why Why is she successful? And, you know, her music is, you know, formulaic and it's generic and who cares? And people are really kind of diminishing her abilities as an artist and I think also as a woman. And I think, you know, there's probably two sides of the arguments where it's like, are people criticizing her because they genuinely don't think she's a good or strong artist or are they criticizing her because she's a woman and there's a lot of misogyny that, you know, goes around, especially yeah. in the creative industries. So I'm much uh, tied into it. And, and you know, like, so I was at a folk festival earlier this year. Yeah. And they do this song competition every year where they choose one artist and they invite all the bands that perform to submit a song and they have to do a, like a variation of this artist, um, yeah. of their songs. And they've, they've had The Waves, they've had Elton John, they had Dolly Parton <laughs> as well. Um, and I really got to be in my bonnet about this thing because they had been running for 20 years or so and Dolly Parton was the first woman soloist yeah who had been chosen to be celebrated in the song competition. Yeah. And so when they were putting the call out for who is the next artist that's going to be celebrated for next year's festival, I was like, Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. I was yelling this out. I'm, I'm not a massive Taylor Swift fan, but I was like, she's a woman. She's got um, a huge repertoire to call upon. She's a yeah. folk artist. And the amount of boos that came back after I yelled that out really absolutely shocking and so when I heard your episode which if you haven't already picked up on it's called she's not even that good a lyricist the double-edged sword of popularity uh, of pop music and I was like I have to talk to you about this because (laughs) why did that happen (laughs) what is going on here why is there so much hate going towards her yeah 
And I think it's interesting because there's also another thing to that about her folk genre and her country music background. I think even when she was an upcoming artist and did a lot more of that country sound within the country community, but I also think the pop music community, people just didn't want to validate the type of music she was claiming she was making in that genre. Like people like, oh, she's not really that much of a pop musician or whatever. And then people in the country music community were like, oh, she's not really that country. It's like it, it, the amount of like. We had rules and regulations. Exactly. It's like, you know, I understand that we have to be somewhat, you know, like logical about the like saying what genre of music we're making to like help people I don't know understand the type of music you're making but at the end of the day I think people just wanted a reason to nitpick the type of music that she's making or claiming that she was making um Mm -hmm. and you know the fact that people booed your comment I think says a lot about you know not everyone feels that way about Taylor Swift but I do think Anytime someone becomes very popular, people claim it to be overrated. And if people view something to be overrated, they claim it to be not very good. Or if they, even if they think it's good, they're just kind of like, oh, well, everyone else likes that. And I don't want to like that. And like, sure, people might have legitimate reasons again, why they don't like Taylor Swift's music. But I don't think that that's the kind of commentary we're seeing online or in general. I think people are actually like diminishing her abilities as an artist because they're saying things like oh she's not even that good of a lyricist like is she even a real musician or she just uses the same Ford chords um as if like they're all bad things you know like it's Mm -hmm. just yeah yeah so much criticism and I think uh, so when I reached out to you we sort of got onto the topic of making money as an artist or as a creative and how that in itself is also a double-edged sword that we all have to pay our bills and and live but if you make too much money you're seen as a sellout like talk to me about that yeah I think it's interesting like obviously the people who come up as like indie folk artists or you know maybe they start from nothing and then gain a bit of success And I feel like that's within every music community, whether it's like you're a DJ or, you know, you're a classical musician. It doesn't really matter. It's like people don't want to feel like you sell out at any point because then they feel like you're no longer this like pure artist that they started listening to. And obviously there will always be people who are happy for you that you're like gaining success or you are starting to get, you know, money where you can finance your creative endeavors but I feel like people associate um, things like advertisement and sponsor- sponsorships and um, uh, even asking for money for, like, seeing them live. I think people associate that as, like, oh, like, wh- why why do they suddenly need money? Like, don't they love what they do? And... Um, Or people look at advertisement and think that's yucky. Like, why would they sell themselves out like that? But it's like, Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, for people who want to work in the creative industries, there has to be some leeway because if people want to make money off being a creative, they at some point they have to either get with advertising or they have to get with sponsorships or they have to accept the fact that they need money if they play live. They can't just be playing live for free anymore. And I think people in the creative industries really exploit creative individuals a lot of the time because they go, oh, like, we won't pay you, but this is really good exposure. And it's like, yeah, (laughs) but I understand if someone does that once, like, or a couple of times when they're maybe in university or in high school, But if you have a degree or you have um, a serious portfolio of things that you've achieved as a creative person, you shouldn't be doing that for free after a certain point. Like you should be getting paid for that work. And it feels so yucky to say it to people to be like, actually, I don't want to do that because I don't think that I see 
like any financial compensation for the work that I'm doing, Mm -hmm. it's really hard to be proactively saying that to people because it feels yucky because you're like, oh, like this is something creative. I should just love to do it for free anyway. But if someone genuinely wants to make money off the creative endeavors they do, they should be 100% allowed to. And on the other side, on the other side of that, I'm sure there are creative people who go, being creative is just a hobby. I don't want to make money from it. And I just do it for fun. Like I don't need money from anyone. And that's also fine because they've made that choice. But I think people, uh, people are just highly critical when it comes to seeing an artist go from pretty much nothing and never needing advertisement or money from anyone. And then slowly seeing them do that and they go oh why are they doing that now it's like they want to make money (laughs) yeah yeah so you mentioned the word sellout before like what what is a sellout really i uh i would say that a seller is someone that's considered taking any kind of financial gain even if their values or morals don't align um But I I think that's an interesting one when people claim that artists are sellouts, like even when the likelihood is their values do align. Like if a artist, I don't know, um, takes on a sponsorship on their tour and they genuinely like the product or the thing that they're sponsoring, like, you know, who am I to sit here and say that they're a sellout? But I'm sure there are situations where um, famous people or celebrities take a product or a number of products and claim to say, oh, I love this, but they've never used it before. Or or maybe the product itself is unethical and they're supporting something that they shouldn't and therefore Mm -hmm. they're a sellout. But do I think that Taylor Swift's a sellout because she makes pop music that is relatable to mass people like she mass produces me like no I don't I don't think that makes you a seller I think that just means that she knows exactly what people want in a certain demographic and that just makes her a smart business person but people don't see that because they they just the misogyny of it all you know like (laughs) it always comes back to the misogyny it always comes back to misogyny but also like I've you know I grew up around a lot of people who loved making music and I I did a degree in music and sound design so I was with a lot of people who made music I don't personally make music but I listen to a lot of it and I respect people who make music and have opinions about Taylor Swift's music because I, I get it if it's coming from a place of genuine critique about her songs themselves but when the moment that people start saying things like yeah, but I don't understand why she's successful or, like, how do people like this music anyway? Like, it's rubbish or um, her lyrics are crap. Like, once people start making generalizations about her capabilities, that's when I stop, like, that's when I stop thinking that what they're saying is coming from a credible place because it's not like they're coming with, like, specific reasons as to, like, okay, but these set of lyrics didn't make sense or this melody was, like, repetitive. Like, I don't know. It just sometimes I feel like it's I'm just being thrown with, like, general comments, you know, and nothing yeah. too specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, unfiltered, biased criticism that are not, it's not necessarily related to the quality of her craft, craftswomanship. Yeah, and also, like, why is it bad that, like I was talking to someone once and they were like, oh, like only 14 year old girls like Taylor Swift music. Now, even if that was the case, which I know for a fact, it's not just 14 year old girls. Like there are a lot of women in their mid twenties and above who freaking love Taylor Swift. Um, And I mean, what, like, I can't remember now, but like the ticket sales in Australia in the pre-sale was like, 800,000 people like it was was huge and I think more in the general sale and the Amex sale but it's like even if it was true that it was just 14 year old girls why is that a problem what what why does a 14 year old girl equal not good and I think there's a real because there's a real negative connotation about a women 
And this idea that if you cater for kids or young people, that means that your content is inherently crap, which Mm -hmm. is just such a snobbish thing to say, because like, like, why is that bad? Like, I genuinely, why is that? Why can't 14 year old girls have a good time in the music that they listen to? Like, why is that? Why is that demonized? It makes no sense to me because (laughs) It's just so reductive to say something like that, I think, in my opinion, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, this is all of our two opinions. But, yeah, I agree. It's strange that there are sort of rules placed on, like, this is good, this is bad, this is worthwhile, this is not worthwhile. Yeah. Um, And the idea of the sellout saying, if you are sponsored by this brand, it's okay, but that brand's not okay. Yeah. I guess the sellout idea is that the implication is that you are blindly amassing money without any sort of strategy or regard for it. Yeah. But but then again, like what is the dollar point of a sellout, sellout? At what point do you become a sellout? Is it when you make a hundred dollars? Is it make a thousand dollars? Well, exactly, exactly. And look, I, I, I'm always conflicted in this, like this kind of conversation where it gets to like the the ethics around you know millionaires and billionaires, right? Like, do I think it makes sense for individuals to amass? great amount great amounts of money when there is so many people who live below the poverty line like it doesn't really make any sense like on a, on a human level it feels quite wrong and obscene and that's why i said at the beginning like taylor swift's making obscene amounts of money but to be fair she i heard she's like giving like hundreds and thousands of dollars to like the workers on the tour like she is like getting some of that revenue she's putting in her pocket to other people on the tour so Tops to her for that. But, you know, I you know, I have no issue with criticizing the fact that people like Taylor Swift use private jets as buses. Like, and what's that, what is that doing to the environment? And like what like I just think at what point it, it's very hard because I think with celebrities and people who great get uh, like big amounts of wealth, it is hard not to criticize them because it is obscene and at what point is wealth kind of this unethical thing that we're just letting happen where individuals can just make shit loads of money. But like, I'm less concerned about Taylor Swift and probably more concerned about someone like Jeff Bezos. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I'm not gonna like, and I feel like that's another thing that happens, right? Like, yes, we can criticize Taylor Swift for maybe like being excessively wealthy, but it's like, there is also a lot of men who are excessively wealthy and like, again, to just blame the next woman who's successful because of that just feels so like, really, we're going to, we're just going to blame the woman again. Like, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. 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 But you know, I definitely consider like it, it definitely crosses my mind on an ethical level about, you know, where's the line in terms of like how much wealth you can just accumulate. Like, you know yeah 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 I mean that's way bigger than that's way bigger than creativity and create uh, creative thing for sure much bigger conversation and agree yeah <laughs> there needs to be a point there but what do you think it is that in the creative space in particular people are expected to donate their skills for free oh yeah I think because there's an expectation that we love it unconditionally, which is a really kind of manipulative thing to put back on people who are creative. Like, oh, but you love this, so I shouldn't have to pay you because you love it, which that actually works. (laughs) Like people, and for me, for instance, like uh, the amount of times where I have convinced myself, yeah, I love this, so like I can do it for free. And while that may be true, that doesn't make it right. Like, it doesn't mean it's okay for me to then do, like, a 100 hours for free because I love it so much. Like, sure, I'll probably end up doing it because I love it, but that doesn't make it right. And I think people 
and I think people have this assumption that people only say that when they're not creative themselves, but I actually think the really toxic part about the creative industries is there are creative people themselves who put that onto other creative people who say, but you love this. Like we love this. So like, we're going to, you know, blood, sweat and tears grind through this, but it's like, realistically people should be getting paid for creative labor. It It's, it's work. Mm. It, you know, no matter which way you cut it, it's work. People are working for a job. They're following a brief. They should be getting paid for it. And I think it's very manipulative when people kind of throw that phrase around and say like, oh, but you love it. Um, and look, do I think that it within reason you're going to do some free labor for exposure? Absolutely. Like that's like, Throughout high school and throughout university, I did a bunch of random stuff for free and I knew that it would it would lead to good things. Um, mm. But you have to set a boundary with yourself to a certain point where you stop doing that. You really have to, especially if you want it to be your career, because you'll just keep getting taken advantage of from people because they go, oh, but you've done all this other work for free. Like, why not some more? Yeah. yeah. I mean, for you as well, because you're obviously a creative person. Like, do you feel like you had to set that boundary with yourself where you go, actually, I should be paid for that. Like, I've done enough free labor that I should actually get money for that job. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And love the fact that you said I'm a creative person, because um, just on that point, so many people think that marketing is not a creative endeavor because it is purely about Mm -hmm. building a brand, building status and getting money for businesses. Um, So I've met the end of that criticism a fair few times, actually. But certainly uh, I made a pivot in my career, which ended up me making crisp communications, which is my business. Um, And when I knew that I wasn't happy in my previous career, which was a management track, and I was moving further and further away from creative um, yeah. creativity every day, I did seek out opportunities to get skills and build my network for free. Yeah. But as soon as I knew that I had that, I was confident I'd learned enough, done. Like, now, now you pay me for this. <laughs> Because my end goal was to make it my my living, not just keep my creativity for after hours, make my entire life way more creative, way more fun. Um, so I knew that I needed to get paid for it. But I do think it's what is like one hand you're building your your resume and you're building your portfolio, and sometimes you do have to do stuff for free. But then when people know that and they try and um, exploit that. It, it is a very slippery slope and it is very difficult because if you don't do it, someone else will do it. Yeah, and I think, you know, like it has to be on your terms as well. If you're consciously aware of the fact that you're about to do something for free, it, that needs to be a really conscious decision and it needs to be on your terms. Like, for instance, with like Seamon Star, just the way that you said then that you took opportunities to like gain those skills – when I was doing music reviews, like I was doing all that as free labor. I went to a lot of like indie artist shows that I wasn't being paid to do and writing reviews. And like, there was a lot of free labor, but it was on my terms and it was what I wanted to do. And to be honest, a lot of the artists in the last like few months of me doing that were like, Hey, like, I'll put your name on the door. I'll get you a ticket, you know, which was like amazing to see kind of like how me doing reviews for like months upon months was actually starting to get artists to like trust me and say, I'll pay for you to like come essentially, yeah. um, which is a which is a great outcome really. But is it not- because like their creators themselves, they probably Absolutely. have done gigs for free. They're trying to return the favor to you. <laughs> 100%. But again, I was okay with that because as much as I knew they were trying to, you know, get successful and make money, so was I. But it's like I, I kind of – it didn't feel like a power dynamic. Like it didn't feel inappropriate that we were both kind of helping each other. Like 
I feel like that's a very specific situation. Whereas like, if you're a creative person and there's someone at a higher level than you making you do free labor, that to me feels a bit wrong and exploitative. But if two young creative people are kind of like, let's help each other, that feels less harmful in the long term and that to me is where free labor is a little more acceptable in my opinion like especially during university a lot of uni students are doing a lot of free labor for each other and that doesn't feel icky because you're both trying to help each other you're both unemployed trying to figure your shit out like it's you know it's all <laughs> fair. but it's when the context <laughs> yeah but it's when someone who is making bank and is like yeah, you just come along and help me. Like people who do internships or, you know, um, who do work experience that I think they definitely should be being paid for that, but they don't because there's a lot of loopholes and people get away with stuff like that. Um, But even what you said, I wanted to go back with what you said before about how people said that they didn't consider you creative because you work in marketing and people don't associate marketing with being creative. I get into arguments all the time with certain creative people because I think there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of like snobbishness around what people consider as being creative. And I think people have a very boxed in idea of like that, that makes a creative person, someone who never sleeps, eat, they breathe their creative, you know, job or whatever. And like, they want to be this obsessed person of their craft. That's a creative person, which is such an unrealistic idea of what a creative person is. Like, I don't know if you've ever watched the movie um, Whiplash by any chance. No, but tell me about it. <laughs> oh, it's about a guy who essentially is obsessed with being the best jazz drummer of all time. And he's so, like, he's so fixated on the fact that he wants to be the best. He wants to be seen as the best. And essentially throughout the entire movie, without spoiling it, you see how obsessed he be- becomes with the idea that he needs to be the best at this. He loses relationships. He has a terrible relationship with his family. He doesn't sleep properly. He's not eating properly. Like, he's deeply unhappy. But the thing that's keeping him alive is the fact that he's like, I will die to be the best. And some people watch that movie and think that that's aspirational because in their minds, they're doing the same thing. They're going, I need to be the best creative in whatever, whether it's a musician or a painter or a writer. It doesn't matter could be anything creative someone in marketing like it literally doesn't matter I'm gonna be obsessed with this project or thing but be deeply unhappy on a personal level because being obsessed about anything I think is going to end miserably and obviously you could say that some of the most successful people in the world end up being successful because they are so obsessed with being the best but I just think on a human level, is that aspirational or is that just an example of how you can be really successful? That, I yeah, like, and I yeah. just think the fact that people have this very isolated idea of what a creative is feels really demeaning to people like you. And I mean, I've certainly copped it. Like the fact that I work in a commercial space, a lot of like artists are very much like, oh, but you work in a commercial space. And like you, you basically sold your soul um, because you're not committed to being this like creative person with Simon's Productions, which I still do. I still do my podcast. I still get to be creative every other hour of my life. But I gotta, I gotta pay bills. I gotta, you know, like it's. I don't see that as selling out or copying out. It's just, it, it it's the name of the game. It's you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. And so let's talk about Sea Monster Productions as well. So this is basically a vessel for you to share your creative projects. And you've sort of mentioned the writing and the interviews that you did prior. And now it's kind of like this endless scope, (laughs) a little box that you can put things into. Where did that start? 
how did it how did that happen and what like what are your plans with that so it's so funny actually because my um parents are currently moving um houses and I had to go back to Sydney I'm in Melbourne back to Sydney to like see all my childhood stuff to see what I could throw out keep all that kind of thing oh yeah I actually (laughs) found the childhood drawing I did of sea monster like the logo that I currently have because I drew it when I was a kid I thought it was a cute little monster thing that I came up with I think I wanted to be a cartoonist at some point (laughs) so cute (laughs) yeah so I made this little sea monster and then obviously years later like two three years ago I was like oh I'm a creative person. What am I going to do? I, I've always wanted the, I, I always like the idea of starting my own business and being my own boss. Like that has always, which obviously meeting people like you has always been a joy because I love meeting people who start their own business. I think it's just so inspiring. And my auntie is a photographer and she did that and her business is like booming. Like it's just so awesome watching people start their own businesses. Um, because I actually think that if you start your own business, you're inherently creative because I think business and creativity are quite entwined. So I always wanted to like have my own thing and Sea Monster was what I came up with and I always loved the drawing that I did. So I was like, great, that's my logo. Um, It's a letter C, by the way. It's not like a sea monkey. No. The letter C made into a monster. It's super cute. Yeah, it's it's the letter C with big fang teeth as if it's like this monster, alphabetic monster, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I just when I created it, honestly, I had no idea what I was gonna do with it. And then I slowly just was like, Well, I'm just gonna create creative projects. And Sea Monster Productions is just again, like you said, like the vessel. It's the it's the hub, it's the home page for all of this. And I originally, the thing that started it all was the podcast, uh, Sounds of Reason, because I did my degree in like music and sound design. So I was like, great, I'll start a podcast. I love talking. I love talking to people. I love stories. It's great. So I started doing that under Sea Monster Productions. And then I started doing the um, music in bed interviews that I did with like lots of artists that I was like friends with throughout high school and uni. And I sat in their beds with them and we talked about making music in their bedroom. And that was a lot of fun. Um, And like, I think even just the fact that I got to see what I liked and didn't like, I, I think so often creative people, it's like, we feel like, oh, we just need to pick one thing and get it right. But honestly, in the last three years, I've done lots of little things and figured out what I hate and what I really like. And so far, the only thing that's really stuck is actually the podcast. I think as much as I love doing the artist interviews and the reviews, um, it's a lot of work. And to be totally honest, I actually feel like reviewing music is no longer something that I think is that important because... I think if people write a song, great. Like, I don't need to give an unsolicited opinion about it, which, look, reviews are helpful, but I just think I'm like, nah, like, if people want to make music, I, I don't really care. Like, I, I <laughs> my my passion for reviewing people became very, like, I just became indifferent about it because I was like, I actually am not that opinionated. And most of the times when I wrote reviews, it was never really about is this good or not. I was like, how did this song make me feel? Like it wasn't really coming from a place of like it's good or bad. So I was like, why am I even doing this? I'm just telling people how I feel when I listen to a song. It's like <laughs> a very it, public diary. Dear diary. Can I very, this song? It yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was a very public diary, I think, of just me journaling about how music made me feel, which feels very emo and yeah. Um, I love it. Love the Evo. (laughs) I think it's cool. I I just, I think so much of creativity is exploration and testing and seeing what makes you feel good. And that's sort of one of the topics we cover on the podcast is people who are, who consider themselves not to be creative. How do they find creativity in their life? Yeah. Starting point, I always say is like, just try, try stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Go to a paint and sip glass, go sing in the shower, go go for a walk. I don't know, like 
just do things and see what makes you happy because creativity for me is like just happiness and exploration and freedom exactly and I just think you like you hit the nail on the head like I think even if you're not a creative person just merely exploring things that you like and don't like in terms of your career or even hobbies things that you don't do at work it's it's just so important because you're never gonna know if you like something or not until you try it like I I've done plenty of part-time jobs that I thought I was gonna love and then I ended up hating so it's just a matter of yeah figuring out like what what do you want to do and you know again like having something having the freedom as a creative to know that you can create as many projects as you want and quit whenever you want is a very liberating thing, you know, not commit, not forcing yourself to say, well, if this doesn't work and if this fails, then I give up. Like it just feels so like, it does feel really dramatic when being an artist often does feel very dramatic. But I, I know at the end of the day, no matter what project I create tomorrow or in a week or in a month or in a year. Like I actually just have to be okay with the fact that I'm allowed to quit that and try something else if I'm not feeling it anymore. Like it's, it's just a part of being a human. Yeah. 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 Try before you buy and then shop around. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I think, um, I feel like we probably need to wrap it up there, but yeah, I think that was a fantastic conversation. We started with Taylor Swift. We ended I know. up <laughs> general creativity. Yeah. Uh, but I appreciate you coming on board and sharing um, your viewpoints because it. we did recently have someone on the podcast who was who has positioned herself as a pricing queen and she basically helps people realise their value and charge Right. So I thought this was like another interesting, slightly adjacent viewpoint to this. <laughs> Definitely helped round up our season. So thanks so much, Alice, for joining me today. It was a pleasure. I, I had a lot of fun. I've never yeah. been on somebody else's podcast before. It's very exciting. Oh, well, that is very exciting. <laughs> and everyone who's here to join in and, and hear it. So I want to say thank you to everyone who has actually tuned in today to Creativity Uncovered. I I really hope that this episode has um, has inspired you and that it helps you summon your creativity the next time that you need it. If you've made it this far, a huge thank you for your support and tuning into today's episode. Creativity Uncovered has been lovingly recorded on the land of the Cubby Cubby people, and we pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This podcast has been produced by my amazing team here at Crisp Communications, and the music you just heard was composed by James Gatling. If you liked this episode, please do share it around and help us on our mission to unlock more creativity in this world. You can also hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episode releases.